Welcome everybody. Happy to see everybody here on what feels like a Friday afternoon at four o'clock, sort of, doesn't it? I don't know. We're the only ones, almost the only ones standing between you and a drink, or you and dinner, or you and a, and, uh, a flight out of here. So we really appreciate you being here. Um, you see up here on the title slide our long names and our long titles, so you can just read those. Welcome to the session. Uh, before we get into describing our project, we want to share with you a little bit about, let's see, there we go, a little bit about our institutional context. We're with a California community college. Uh, there are 112 California community colleges. The system serves 3 million students a year. Our particular, our particular college is located in northern, northern Los Angeles County, uh, beautiful Southern California where it's, what, 80 degrees right now. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we serve about, uh, we serve a headcount of about 25,000 25, students a year, around 15,000 full-time equivalent students, around 13% of our full-time equivalent students are in our online program, our online delivery mode. So that's sort of the context within which we approach OER, trying to serve that kind of students. I should also mention it's a comprehensive community college. We offer everything from automotive technology degrees to welding degrees and everything in between in uh, history and philosophy and English and so on, uh, the classic liberal arts tri uh, curriculum as well as workforce development. Uh, we want to acknowledge that the support for our project comes from uh, a U.S. Department of Education FIPSI, uh, FIPSI Special Focus Grant, uh, and I should back up and, and uh, say also with our institutional context, we are proud members of the uh, Community College Consortium for Open Educational Resources, which has merged with the Open Courseware Consortium, and we're proud members of the Open Courseware Consortium. Uh, and with that, I will turn this over to John, who's going to describe our project. Hey, everybody. How's everyone doing? All right. So uh, I'm going to uh, slide ahead here. Oh, actually, I can go back and forth. Yeah, I'm good. So uh, I'll give you the uh, takeout menu of sorts, what, we're, what I'm going to be uh, tackling here in terms of the, the rest of this presentation. Um, we're going to talk about you know, our project as a whole, and I'm going to give you sort of an overview of that. But uh, we're going to start with a brief discussion about the motivations for the alternatives uh, to textbooks. You know, obviously, the textbook is the traditional model. What are some of the alternatives as we go forward? Uh, we'll uh, cover the goals of our Open Educational Resources Grant, what our grant is, uh, is what the uh, goals we're trying to accomplish are. Uh, identify some of the basic steps involved in creating uh, a content playlist, and I'll go over, you know, in general what that means. And uh, have a brief uh, Q&A at the end talking a little bit about uh, your thoughts about open content delivery. So that's where we're going to head in terms of the presentation today. Um, Obviously, you know, we, through this conference, there have been a variety of talks talking about sort of uh, the, the drive or the motivation to produce OER. And uh, even this morning, uh, there were several uh, you know, mentions about sometimes the motivation is cost, sometimes it's a belief in the movement. There's, a, there's all kinds of reasons. Certainly one of the reasons that has motivated many of us to be so excited about the OER movement is trying to find ways to reduce the cost of instructional materials for students. We, we certainly know that that is a big core part of the problem. So uh, I was at uh, Nicole Allen's uh, talks earlier today and she went over some, uh, some of the cost of, of textbooks relative to uh, the cost of instruction. In the California Community College system, let me just break this down for you to give you some context. Um, let's say an example, student spends $180 on a textbook, $30 on a textbook supplement, total cost of $210, right? In California, the Community College system, though we are pretty significantly lower in price than a lot of other states. A three unit course at $36 a unit, $36 a credit hour in California, adds up to about $108 if I did my math correctly. Um, that means in this particular scenario, the textbook and supplement represent about two thirds of the overall cost of the course. I think uh, Nicole had numbers around 70, 75%. So somewhere in that range in terms of significant chunk of the cost of the course. And this is what really drove us to want to uh, pursue uh, study and research and, and get involved with OER, not just on our campus, but you know, how can we try to solve the problem on a larger scale? So, of course, we have to ask questions like, how do we challenge some of the traditions? Is it, you know, do we want to go down the traditional path of textbooks still? Is it digital textbooks? Is it learning objects? Is it collections? Um, possibly it's you know, some of the more complex solutions with feedback loops and mechanisms in there. So these are all valid questions to ask. 
And what we decided to do in our project is really give some thought to the following concept, and that is this. There's a tremendous amount of movement now, especially in the last year with um, uh, the uh, Department of Labor grants and whatnot, to create uh, full course solutions, right, to open educational resources, to sort of start from the ground up and really build full high quality courses. Well, that leaves a whole farm of op existing open educational resources out there, right? I mean, we know there's multiple repositories out there. There's a lot of different objects out there to be pulled from, many of which are used actively right now. So um, our project wanted to focus on, cre first of all, and on our campus, just individually at our campus, creating some supplemental materials, you know, working with our faculty at our school to create supplemental materials. So we start with that. Then sort of leading into developing the concept of the playlist, which again I'll go into greater detail on in a moment, of academic content to either supplement or replace textbooks. And then our final goal, and this may really transition into perhaps other opportunity, grant opportunities down the road, would be to try to expand this model into something that goes beyond what we do at our school and hopefully make it that much more useful for other colleges, other institutions, other states, you name it. So that's where we're going with this. Now, of course, playlist is what I want to highlight. Now, this term may evolve and change over time, but really it came from the, uh, the old model of the, you know, the, and we've all seen this sort of thing before, the demise of, or demise of the record store, right? I don't know how many of you know the title Sam Goody, but in California that was a big chain of record stores for a number of years, and it just, I think there might be like a couple locations left, I'm not sure. But we've seen uh, business models change very rapidly, extremely rapidly. So what we're trying to do, is, and what we're all trying to do really, but obviously in, in our grant as well, we're trying to find a solution to the fact that there are a bunch of individual objects out there that we can work with. So what is a playlist? What, what do we call a playlist in our grant? Well, essentially the idea is, and it, it's somewhat similar to what uh, the folks at OER Blue are doing, but uh, I'll, I'll kind of add a layer of, uh, of complexity here on top of it. The idea is to create a common voice in learning objects. So if you go and farm learn learning objects out there, one of them was written by you, and another was written by you, and another was written by you, and you all have different ways of presenting that material, right? Possibly you use different key terms, you have a different style of trying to introduce the concept to a student, there's all of these different issues that, that play into it. What we're doing is finding one author, and instead of having that one author write a whole book from scratch, we're having, having that one author develop transition pieces to essentially guide the student through the process of going through these OER objects. That develops the common voice of this content, right? So that's essentially where we're starting. And an, an author, a uh, faculty member, an uh, author of some sort would write introductory text to lead the student into what we're about to cover in chapter 10, let's say, then lead to an OER object, perhaps a website with text and articles, another transition piece written by that same author that allows the author to provide a summation to what the student just went through in that last OER object and transition very clearly into the next object. So that's the goal there. Lead into a chunk of media, you know, video, let's say, another piece of transition text, and then finally onto another website, so on and so forth, this chain continues. Now the goal is that this could simulate the effect of a textbook, but add another layer of, of a sort of dynamic interaction between the student and the content. Um, now, uh, I've been fascinated with what OER Blue is doing. I've, I've certainly gone to, I went to the uh, talk yesterday about that, that, uh, that Joel gave, and um, the sort of, I, I would say the biggest difference here is that this sort of uses the same idea of putting content, sequencing content together. The added layer is that common voice, right? That's the added layer of produ producing the transition materials in between. So uh, why would we consider playlists? There, as I said, there's a bunch of open content out there. Could playlist development be an easier process to sustain than full textbook development? We know, I think all of us in this room know, that it is not cheap and, does not, and, it, and it does require a considerable amount of, amount of effort to develop a textbook from scratch. I'm sure that's very common knowledge in here. So this, we hope, is a way to reduce some of that effort, but provide some of the same benefits of, of a unified object. Um, possibly down the road, a fusion of models, right, could actually play into, some, uh, play into a beneficial solution. 
The other benefit is, for a lot of our faculty at least, and I think faculty at multiple colleges, is that the fundamentals of this technique are already familiar. Um, how many of you use course management? Uh, some sort of learning management system. Blackboard, Moodle, right? I mean, almost all of us. When an instructor builds content in their course, typically they're trying to collect a bunch of pieces of content and put it together for their students. This formalizes the process a little bit more, right? Decouples it from the learning management system, produces a unique separate object that consists of all these smaller objects. So this is just a, to give you a snapshot of where we are in the process. We are, we're still in the process of making complete playlists. Um, and I'm going to go over the steps of what we've gone through in our grant. But overall, um, you know, essentially you might have a chapter opener, just some, some introductory text that leads in. Um, this is actually just a, where we are right now. We're building spreadsheets, just massive spreadsheets of identifying content objects out there and listing them out. We're going to be mapping these all into perhaps OER Glue or some other sort of uh, you know, solution to be able to compile all of this content together. Um, I think OER Glue is a, is a nice solution for what we're trying to do, so that's something that we would consider. I need to learn to breathe. <laughs> all right, got a lot to say. There we go. I probably, I probably covered that all in one minute, right? Um, so this is where we are now. We started in October 2009. We were fortunate enough to get a no-cost extension on our grant, so we actually are in our third year of our grant. Um, and essentially, it worked out well because our project really has kind of organically developed into something that really should have taken three years to begin with. Um, we started off in our first year collecting objects and having in faculty create objects from scratch. So we talked to many of our faculty on our campus and had them uh, you know, contribute things that they either already had or uh, small objects they wanted to create, whether it's a video, handout, you name it. So we started with that, and we're up to, in our, we have a repository on our campus, a, a digital repository, that has a roughly 360 objects in it right now. Being that we started from zero at that point, and we're just collecting at this point primarily from our own faculty, that's pretty, pretty substantial growth. Um, our second year focused on collections and projects. So we actually teamed up with groups of faculty on our campus and, and developed sort of teams to solve certain problems. Um, we had one project that uh, is called Building the Scientist, which is the goal is to go beyond what's just in the science textbooks and try to provide a solution where students can get a sense of um, what their expectations are going to be once they leave school and become a scientist. Um, we've worked with uh, some teams on some basic skills, uh, guided learning activities on our campus, and a virtual learning lab, which is uh, sort of a compilation of videos and tutorials uh, to help students become more successful in, in their classes. So, you know, all these separate projects we worked on. And right now we're in that third year where we're developing a playlist. So we're actually co taking those collections of content, trying to compile them into courses, and taking different collections that we worked on separately. In particular, the three major courses we're working on right now are Earth Sciences, Business, and an Animation Design course. So those are where we're going to actually have these playlists developed. You can imagine that the animation design course is going to be much less text heavy and probably have a, a whole lot more in the way of uh, uh, you know, interactive design tools and features and whatnot. In it. But that's the idea uh, in terms of the playlist development. And we've had our challenges, as everyone in this room has had probably in working with OER, um, on, on a single campus, at the scale of a single campus, which is what I'm referring to at this point. Uh, faculty incentives have been a big deal. You know, we're busy. There's no time. Uh, that that's actually one of the biggest the biggest issues. Uh, faculty workload. Um, we've also been uh, challenged, but also successful in working with our bookstore and printing facilities on campus. Our goal is to try to find, uh, you know, at least on our scale of our campus, a solution that allows students to be able to go get copies of of these playlists printed. Uh, that would have at least references to the interactive content in there so that students could access that separately. Um, we, you know, again, it, um, Nicole Allen's talk earlier, she did talk about the fact that 75% of students are still interested in getting print copies of textbooks. So there's still a, a bulk audience that's interested in that, and we want to appreciate that. Um, and then, you know, we've had challenges, of course, with communicating the language. And I don't know how many of you have experienced this before or in the involvement of production of OER, especially media content on your campus, but you know, our media production staff speaks a very different language than our faculty. Um, there's, that, there's a lot that gets lost in translation there. Um, so we have to have frequent meetings to make sure that the goals of the faculty are working very well in tandem 
with the goals of our, our media production uh, staff. And we've had you know, other challenges along the way, and I think the, one of the biggest ones is time. Just time. Uh, it takes a lot of time to put all this together, and uh, you know, the victory is sweet, but it does take a lot of time and effort on the part of many people. So, did I go too fast? Where am I on time? <laughs> wow, okay, so I went very fast. This leaves us a lot of time for questions. Um, and uh, I can go into greater detail on the description of our process and answer any questions you might have. Yes? Can you describe a little bit more about working with the faculty and kind of what, um, what worked in your situation with pulling some of those that were uh, reluctant at first uh, to engage with you? The, the first carrot is <laughs> the following line. You already did the work. You know, faculty have already created content. They created it before we started this project. The question is, are they willing to share it openly? Some aren't, you know, but some aren't. So that's, that's one of the biggest factors is, you know, have they already created it? For those who haven't created it or are interested in creating it, we mentioned to them and we're fortunate through our grant that we were able to get two production staff. So we provide those resources to them. We say, you know, yes, it's going to take you some time. You know, you're going to have to help build, you know, piece together the subject matter. But we have the staff to at least help you put the media together and some of the more complex details. If I can add, add one bit to that, within our context, we've been extremely fortunate that, I think this is fortunate, uh, that in contrast perhaps to many uh, OER projects and institutions, our OER project was really initiated at the very top of our institution. Our chancellor, uh, Diane Van Hook, believes passionately that uh, uh, lowering textbook costs, increasing student access is a social justice issue and it's a core part of our mission. So she has essentially said, go out and do this. Uh, she, she certainly does not order individual faculty to, to do this, uh, but she communicates across the institution that this is a desirable goal for the institution. So that when we approach an individual faculty member, uh, individual faculty members, they know that this, this fits into the larger mission They'll, they'll, they'll get a nice note from the boss, they'll get a pat on the back, they'll, they'll be mentioned in, in uh, campus meetings and so on, so they'll, they'll, be, they'll be lauded for their efforts in that, in that case. So that really certainly you know, has really helped to smooth the way, and I would encourage anybody else who's in a, 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 an institutional setting to, to try your best to get buy-in from the top, because that really has helped. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's, it's uh, incentives beyond just time and money. It's those incentives of uh, institutional support are, are big, really beneficial. Uh, yes. Just uh, piggybacking on that issue of incentive, did the uh, faculty members have incentives in terms of like, raising their reputation by contributing to your project? Well, I think each individual faculty member, uh, as James commented on, uh, ga gained some level of recognition on our campus, at least, uh, for the work that they're doing. And I think recognition goes a long way. Um, you know, w when somebody's working really hard on teaching courses and developing that content, when they have a chance to kind of be on stage of sorts and, and get some recognition for that. That's, that's been a, a real sort of badge of honor for, for a lot of the faculty. And, and, you know, what we've noticed in conversations with other faculty is they said, well, wait a minute, this person's doing that. I, maybe I should consider doing a little bit of that. And they kind of step over a little bit. They don't always step all the way over. Um, but they start moving in that direction. And I think that's, that's how you, the momentum begins slowly. But I think those sorts of things make a big difference. But what about the, the peer recognition among the, the you know, subject specialists in different campuses, even within your system? Oh, got it, got it. Um, you know, at this point, um, I will I've mention one of our faculty in particular. Uh, she teaches, uh, you know, water technology courses on our campus, and uh, her she's pretty tightly uh, connected to the community of other faculty who teach similar subject matter at other colleges, and so they have certainly paid attention to the fact that this content has been created. And I, you know, there's, there have been conversations with, with her colleagues at other colleges about, hmm, maybe we should think about doing stuff like this. Has it led yet to production in mass? No, but again, I think that's a, a slow step one process. So. And I'd add to that, as, at a community college, we're primarily a teaching, teaching institution, uh, so that our faculty are not, that their, their success is not dependent upon publishing, their success is not dependent upon uh, gaining recognition from their peers in the field, in the larger field, uh, which also though can serve as a carrot to the faculty 
to get involved in this kind of production, this kind of sharing, and that is that they are so focused on teaching at their local institution, they don't have an opportunity to interact with other faculty around the state or around the country by sharing, by producing and sharing and adapting, that gives them that opportunity to get back into a little bit of that. I was wondering about the, um, the kiosk solution for students. Is that in printing? Yeah, it would, it would be essentially be printing. Um, where we've been in some initial communications with our bookstore, our campus bookstore, and uh, you know uh, the library to some extent, and our reader graphics department. And I think that the big challenge is sort of uh, getting the rest of the campus to sort of come to that overall understanding of the role of OER and what it plays. Though we've you know been talking OER for a number of years a lot of that conversation was with faculty. So, you know, I think in terms of other departments on campus, they're starting to get on board. The bookstore is starting to get interested in finding solutions that go beyond just selling textbooks because I think they're aware of the fact that textbooks aren't going to be, they may be there for a long time, but the numbers of them probably will somewhat diminish over time, so. Right, and and with, with, the, with the idea of a kiosk that would allow print on demand, the goal there for us is to keep our campus bookstore in the game. Our campus bookstore is a third party vendor. Uh, it's Barnes & Noble. We don't want to put them out of business. You know, they're, they're, we, they're good partners. We want to have a place to buy t-shirts. We want to have a place for, for our students to buy traditional textbooks. We want to have a business partner that kicks back a percentage of their revenue to the college general fund. That's good business for the college. We want to work with them. We want them to be part of the solution. And so our conversations with them about a print on demand kiosk in their facility is a way of doing that. We're not there yet. Right. We're not there yet. But uh, certainly, as the conversation about OER gets louder, generally, our bookstore gets more interested. Mm -hmm. They're they're hearing about it from their national and regional level, and they're saying, "Oh, gee, this really this is real. We need to engage these guys." Uh, and they feel, I think, fortunate <coughs> that we want in, well, we want them to be part of the solution. Well, and two of our faculty have started putting the pressure on, too, which has been a big benefit for us. Um, before, it was us having a conversation about this is coming down the road. Now, two faculty who have adopted open textbooks are going, wait a minute, I want a solution. So that puts additional pressure on, you know, in a positive way. It puts pressure on the bookstore and whatnot to uh, engage even more heavily in that conversation. So. Uh, yeah, I was wondering, at what level, and you might have mentioned this, uh, is a playlist created? In other words, is it an individual teacher that goes in and puts together this playlist, or is it created at a departmental level that you implement for a certain course? Good question. Yeah. Ideally, both. Um, initially, in our first three pilots of the playlist, it's individual faculty. What we're hoping is to approach the departments on our campus and have them develop sort of a more collaborative solution. Um, certainly, at the conference, you know, I've heard some some really good ideas about how. Uh, there's been a little bit more collaboration amongst teams and whatnot in developing OER. We'd like to see this progress down that road. I so. think that, that's a real culture question. You yeah. know, uh, our campus happens to be very decentralized. You know, yeah. you can take a, you can take an academic department of ten faculty. Everybody's using a different book. Everybody's teaching something different. Mm -hmm. You know, and at other institutions, it's not the same. Right. Very good question. We've given a lot of thought to that too. Yeah. Yes. I'm curious about your end product. How is that going to be shared? It, and, and what other um, venues are you thinking of other than OER Glue? Well, you know what? Oh, one okay. One minute. Got it. That's what the hand up was. Okay, good. good. Okay. I'll play with, you, with you. Thank God that we work as a team here. Um, okay, so, so far, because we're at that process of simply assembling the content, that polished end product is somewhat foggy at this point. Okay. Um, OER Glue presents a really good solution because it allows us to piece things together in a very logical way, a packaged way that can be distributed to students, even within the context of a learning management system. Um, we're open extremely, no pun intended, uh, to, to uh, other solutions that would, that would provide us a good pathway. Um, I, I will also put in a plug for um, our content management system that powers our repository, it's Equella, uh, which is also used by British Columbia, North Carolina, Florida, Georgia, it has a federated search option so that uh, content that's in our repository can be discovered by other users of Equella who federate with our repository and vice versa, so uh, that really increases the discoverability. Yeah, and I think I, I, think I get where, where your additional question, you know, we would try to then take that, that content playlist and find other popular repositories to distribute okay. that through. 
Um, so in a, not just necessarily growing our glue, but and not just through our repository, but trying to seek out other repositories and say, mm -hmm. hey, by the way, we've got this thing. Uh -huh. Do you guys want it? So we're getting the hook from the back of the room. We yeah. Thank you very much Thanks for your everybody. attention and your questions. Thank you very much.